Hello, I'm Rajiv Balasubramanian from the University of Utah. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Srini Devdas. Uh, he's the Webster Professor of ECS uh, at MIT. Uh, he's been a faculty member at MIT for over 30 years, and he's very well known in our community for his many contributions in secure hardware. Uh, this is work that has earned him many prizes from the IEEE and ACM. He's also uh, received the most prestigious teaching awards at MIT. Uh, he's delivered a textbook that connects algorithmic puzzles to computer programming. And with that, I'll go to Thank you, Rajiv. Um, it's, uh, it's, a real, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, it's an exciting time in uh, secure hardware and at the intersection of uh, computer security and, uh, and uh, computer architecture. Uh, there have been um, uh, commercial deployments of uh, secure processors by uh, companies such as Intel and AMD over the past few years. Uh, there have also been attacks uh, that have uh, uh, really uh, uh, taken people by surprise uh, as to how potent they are. And so uh, obviously from a standpoint of uh, researchers, uh, this is something that we need to be concerned about if we want to build secure systems. I, and uh, there's a thought or a prevailing thought in uh, this community that uh, perhaps we have to give up on performance uh, in order to uh, get back security because of these uh, potent attacks. And I do have some opinions on the subject and uh, I'd like to uh, give you a sense of that uh, in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, so if you think about uh, what the computers give you from a standpoint of uh, privacy or security, then the one thing that we want from computers is uh, architectural isolation. Now, admittedly, this is something that uh, you might get uh, for free, or it's uh, the default situation when you uh, uh, have a single user on a machine. But really, most computers, uh, even uh, the smallest ones these days, uh, the processors and cell phones, they're all time-shared, and uh, we are dependent on the process abstraction. We have uh, many processes running on these machines, and they have to be compartmentalized. So this uh, CZ flip art is uh, something that uh, tries to describe the fact that you have different containers, you have different compartments, uh, people call them enclaves these days, uh, that are associated with different processes, and you want isolation. You want to be able to separate uh, one user's data from another user's data. Uh, you want to be able to separate sensitive code, and uh, you don't want any mixing. Um, and so this process abstraction has been with us for 50 years, and uh, it's uh, fundamental uh, to, to maintaining privacy. Um, unfortunately, you know, that's what we actually have is this, which is uh, because of uh, breaks in Microarchitectural optimization, or rather breaks in at the level of microarchitecture, uh, you have the uh, leaks and uh, the water leaking out of this bucket corresponds to data leaking out, and uh, an adversary is uh, that adversary could be an operating system, it could be um, a process that is time shared on the same machine. Uh, it is able to infer uh, through. Uh, a variety of means, uh, data, uh, uh, sensitive data that's associated with a different process. And um, the big realization I think that our community has come to over the past couple of years is that um, architectural isolation certainly doesn't imply micro-architectural micro isolation, but more important, um, there's uh, optimizations that have been carried out that have really been with us for decades in computer computers, high performance computers in particular, uh, that give you an attack surface if you're an adversary. And uh, these optimizations are in fact um, the very mechanisms that uh, allow an attacker to uh, leak privacy from uh, various processes. And so, so that's really the dilemma at this point. Uh, do we keep these optimizations around? Uh, do we uh, uh, remove them from our machines and therefore lose performance if you want to get back 
the same level of process isolation that we thought we had. Uh, and so I'd like to give you my answer to this uh, by the end of the talk. And I, I just want to start out with a real simple example. Uh, most people probably know this in this audience, uh, but just to provide context, I want to give people a sense of uh, what these optimizations are, uh, what the issues are with uh, so-called side channels that uh, allow an adversary to leak information uh, from a different process or a different protection domain. And so what you see here is a stylized representation of a uh, last level cache. It is a shared microarchitectural resource. It exists for performance. Uh, it's not required for correctness. And uh, the cache is a two-dimensional structure. Uh, there's uh, horizontal sets that are numbered zero through one. There's vertical ways. And this is an associative cache. And it may be the case that two processes on two different cores, for example, are concomitantly running on your processor, and uh, they're sharing this uh, cache. Now, the way dynamic optimization works is uh, software architects and computer architects love having a shared resource that uh, uh, is available to anybody and everybody using the system, and it's allocated on an on-demand basis where if process zero or process one in this case, uh, wanted more cash, you would get it uh, at the expense potentially of process two. Uh, and perhaps it may be the case that process two doesn't require much of the cash at that particular point of time. And there's usually a tussle associated with these processes and uh, it's taken care of through some arbitration mechanism. And really the, uh, the arbitration mechanism is trying to improve some performance metric associated with uh, the overall performance of the system, and perhaps there's quality of service guarantees for particular processes, but it's essentially a performance game. Um, now what happens here is that uh, you have a situation where uh, you have uh, these two processes sharing the cache, and because there's this tussle, as I mentioned, between these processes, process one can get some information about how much cache process two wants or process two uses. Uh, and it can modulate this and can get more information by essentially orchestrating its memory accesses. And that's what's called a side channel. And this is a microarchitectural side channel. It's probably the primary side channel that's been exploited by attackers these days, the shared left level cache side channel. They're also, they're also called sh uh, cache timing attacks in order to um, leak information uh, from one process. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, the process is, is a privileged process, and I'll say a little bit more about this as I go along, uh, where it's an operating system or system software that can actually allocate resources on its own and therefore do a finer modulation of the shared resource and essentially make this channel that uh, leaks information uh, no noise or have very little noise and have large bandwidth. So a channel has bandwidth, the channel has noise uh, uh, metrics associated with it, and it's the same thing for these uh, leaks of these side channels. Uh, uh, the more potent ones are the ones that are higher bandwidth and have low noise. And certainly the, the LLC, the shared last level cache channel, is uh, one such. Um, and so uh, the other thing that happened, uh, really only about a year ago, uh, was uh, a, a surprising attack uh, that uh, related to the fact that we have uh, fairly fundamental uh, performance mechanisms um, in modern processors that are due to uh, uh, speculation, and in particular, control flow speculation. And it, it turns out there's side channels associated with this. And so these uh, spectre and meltdown attacks uh, exploit the fact that um, you have a situation where in order to run processes faster, uh, most high performance architectures, rather than executing uh, a program in this linear fashion, are going to do some pre-computation of predicates and guess as to which direction a predicate or a branch is going to go, and perhaps the direction is, uh, the correct direction is left, and you guess that, 
but uh, in fact, uh, there's two directions associated with every branch, and uh, it may be the case that uh, I, every once in a while, your branch predictor is going to misspeculate and uh, go right instead of going left, and uh, there's a computation associated with the control flow, and also the instructions that you see here, uh, the, the k, k plus 1, and the k plus 2, are um, instructions that are going to be uh, executed uh, that uh, really should not be executed, and therefore you have to have a rollback mechanism. Uh, the interesting thing here is not that the rollback mechanism is incorrect, you know, all of that is working perfectly well, there's no issue with correctness, but the fact that you're executing k, k plus 1, and k plus 2, and you're affecting the shared microarchitectural state, uh, you're in a situation where you're bringing something into the cache, you're perhaps learning something uh, that uh, is incorrect and updating your branch history table. Uh, there's uh, all sorts of things that can happen here when you're misspeculating, even if you have perfect rollback, and we have a situation where uh, this effect on shared microarchitectural state is uh, actually observable by an adversary, and uh, you can get information because of uh, misspeculation. And uh, these vector attacks were actually carried out on uh, real machines uh, actually about more like a year and a half ago, and they followed a responsible disclosure process, and uh, eventually they were published or uh, publicized uh, about a year ago. And so um, all of these things, I have uh, definitely increased the level of interest of uh, system security folks in the details of computer architecture uh, simply because uh, they're realizing that process isolation is not a given. And this is really good for us as computer architects. Um, so roughly speaking, in the context of control flow speculation, it's really cash tax state uh, that uh, is the medium for leakage. And uh, the other interesting thing is that, uh, again, because of optimizations, uh, there's a lot of shared branch predictive state. Um, you have shared libraries, it's a good idea to learn from your neighbors, you know, at, at least if performance is what you're concerned with. And so you have your neighboring processes that are, are running shared code, shared libraries, and this has really affected uh, the predictor state that is shared across these different processes. And unfortunately, that sharing is turned into leaks. And more interestingly, actually, uh, you can actually manipulate that as an adversary, and you can uh, effectively make a process, learn something uh, that uh, you would like it to learn, and make it misspeculate, and uh, therefore uh, leak more information than you otherwise would, because in effect you have um, a, a control flow injection attack where you're making the process run code uh, in this misspeculated direction that it wouldn't otherwise run. So this is a huge, complex attack service. Um, and so, uh, uh, Joe Lambert and others uh, at MIT tried to categorize this and tried to take uh, a lot of the work that's been going on in uh, side channels over the past 20 years and try and put it into the context of uh, the most recent attacks. And uh, this little schema is uh, what came out of it. So, uh, what you really have is process violation, protection domain violation. So you see these two circles out here that correspond to two different protection domains. Uh, you have the domain of the victim on the left and you have a domain of the attacker on the right. And the idea is that architectural isolation could keep these domains, should keep these domains completely separate. And so there's entities associated with um, these attacks that are essentially pieces of code or pieces of data. And so at some level there's a secret and this could be a cryptographic key, could be uh, something that's associated with um, uh, just sensitive data, medical records, what have you, that's inside the domain of the victim. And uh, there's a channel. I've already talked about channels. There's a variety of different channels that are connecting the domain of the victim to the domain of the attacker. These channels are side channels. You're not going to be able to propagate and break architectural isolation by sending data across this channel. But they're microarchitectural side channels. Now, uh, the other two things that are on this picture um, are the transmitter and the receiver. And uh, these are essentially pieces of code uh, that are going to transmit information 
from uh, uh, one domain to another. And so uh, the classic attack that is 20 years old, that really predates all of the things that I've told you, in, at least in terms of the recent work, is an attack that essentially says, you know what, if I'm running a cryptographic operation like RSA that has a secret key inside, and I have an RSA implementation that you know, clearly has some conditionals inside of it, it's got an infinite in there, and uh, obviously the ciphertext is going to have to depend on the secret key, and therefore there's going to be these if then else's that take the secret key bits and are going to do different things based on whether the bit is a zero or a one, and if in fact there's modifications of behavior that result from taking the if or the then that are observable by an adversary on the outside, because the adversary is monitoring the memory access channel outside the chip, uh, or uh, the adversary can time the, uh, the uh, the program, or the adversary can uh, time, or excuse me, measure uh, power dissipation, then you have a side channel again. Right? It's not a microarchitectural side channel, but it's a side channel. And you can actually figure out one by one if you've written this code uh, in a way that um, is looking at bits one by one and going through these branches, you can figure out whether the secret key bit is a zero or a one, and you don't have to look at the ciphertext. You look at the power channel, you look at the memory access path. Right, so this is a classic 20-year-old attack uh, that uh, certainly made waves you know, back in the mid-90s and uh, people went and changed their RSA implementations on smart cards and what have you in order to protect against these types of attacks. Um, so this is certainly something that this uh, uh, schema uh, uh, represents. It's just uh, different uh, values for uh, the channels and uh, uh, the transmitters and so on. The transmitter here is uh, pre-existing. It's an if-then-else, it's a predicate that's inside of the program. Um, now, uh, it turns out that uh, there were bugs in the control pipeline associated with uh, modern processors, and uh, the meltdown attackers showed that uh, because the permissions checks were not carried out in sort of the perfectly uh, correct way, uh, that you had a situation where um, you could actually leak information. Again, there was a predicate that's associated with the permissions check, and uh, I'm not going to say more about it. Uh, this other than you could actually um, write a little transmitter uh, if corresponding to the meltdown attack and that would uh, essentially let you read uh, kernel code uh, if uh, you were able to uh, attack a particular machine uh, and uh, compromise the machine to the point where you made it run uh, this particular transmitter. Um, and then perhaps the most interesting uh, attack in this realm are the spectre attacks uh, that correspond to uh, taking existing code and not actually injecting code as a meltdown, but synthesizing this code out of existing code by using the branch predictor uh, example that I gave you, where you effectively inject code because you've trained the branch predictor uh, to go do uh, things that are uh, um, out of scope, really, for a particular process. Right? So I want to say a lot more about attacks here. These are really motivators for uh, the work I'm going to do. I uh, described, uh, and, uh, and but as you can see here, uh, there's uh, some serious issues associated with uh, our modern architectures when it comes to uh, architectural isolation and maintaining. Um, and there's any number of side channels. Uh, real systems are complicated. Uh, they have uh, many privilege levels. You got the BIOS. You got the hypervisor. You have uh, uh, the operating system. And then there's enormous amounts of sharing uh, associated with uh, computers, as you can see here. Uh, and you know, DRAMs are shared, last level caches are shared, and, and what have you. So uh, th this is uh, our challenge. Um, so uh, to summarize uh, what I'm going to try and sell here, uh, academically and intellectually, uh, no products, um, is simply that uh, we have to strengthen the process abstraction. Um, and so uh, the term enclave was popularized by Intel and SGX. Uh, it, the notions uh, predate SGX. Uh, you can think of enclaves as being containers. Uh, they're essentially things that uh, have uh, security guarantees uh, that are stronger than processes, and uh, they need hardware support. So uh, my thesis is that we have to build enclaves on enclave platforms, the pieces of hardware. We have to have hardware assists in order to build these enclaves properly. Uh, the enclaves 
are secure under particular threat models. You have to be precise about what these threat models are. And uh, you have to raise, really, the uh, security guarantee that you're providing to include not just architectural isolation, but also micro-architectural isolation. And the level of increase in isolation is a function of the, of the threat model and the uh, concern that you have of what the adversary could do. Right? So that's really a summary of, uh, of my talk. Um, so just in terms of a little more detail, uh, processes are going to isolate memory from each other. So I'm not going to touch your process. If I'm a different one, I can't touch your memory. That's architectural isolation. Now that's not a problem as I've described before. Um, you want a stronger guarantee. Uh, you don't want to be able to infer it you know, through these side channels. Uh, the specifics of that are things that you have to worry about uh, in the threat model. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about enclaves uh, is that uh, you can largely decouple performance from security in the sense that uh, when you want more protection, you do more checking. And when you don't want protection, you just go off and because it's public data, you don't care about leakage, you can do your own uh, regular computation, you can go about your merry way, uh, kind of oblivious to all of these attacks. Right? But you would like that. And Enclave certainly has some promise in being able to decouple performance from security. Um, I'm fond of saying there's no such thing as minor surgery, there's no such thing as uh, non-invasive hardware modification. And uh, in fact, uh, it's something that every hardware designer knows that you have to reach the inner chip. Um, you know, maybe there's a metal mass that needs to be changed. And these are things that are uh, really rare occurrences, especially for security bugs. And so it's difficult to really change hardware. You'd love to be able to get away with uh, changes in runtime or software. Uh, but obviously, you'd like to have the hardware changes that are associated with changing a processor from being insecure in some fashion to secure in a new version to be uh, uh, as uh, minimally invasive as possible. And uh, so, again, enclaves can help with that. And so these are things that obviously I will uh, give you some hard evidence for before I'm done. Um, I like having strong notions of security and having simple arguments that provide security mechanisms or guarantees of security. I'm not a fan of what, what's called heuristic security or ad hoc security where uh, you uh, have uh, essentially, let's say, randomization or scrambling uh, which doesn't have an argument, perhaps a graphic, perhaps uh, uh, a different kind of argument that's associated with uh, maintaining security or arguing security. Um, I like the idea of uh, saying that there's a hard problem associated with uh, this cryptographic construction or uh, what have you, and uh, if the hard problem stays hard, uh, you're going to be in a situation where, uh, uh, where you have security. And so uh, there's also invariance, uh, simple invariance that can be argued, and that's more of the kind that uh, happened here in this type of work of architectural isolation. And simple arguments that uh, maintain isolation are things that really can be uh, uh, sold to hardware designers. Uh, you want hardware changes to be simple, and you want the arguments that correspond to these uh, changes giving you what you want to be simple as well. Um, so the last thing I want to say before I dive into uh, some significant technical detail is uh, uh, something I alluded to, which is how privileged is your adversary. And again, this is a situation where you'd like to raise the bar to the point where uh, you uh, have guarantees under a potent adversary, uh, because then uh, you're going to sort of take care of the unprivileged adversary or the adversary who's uh, just a normal process running. And so you have computer bases that are uh, uh, really uh, have huge trusted computing uh, 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 notions, or I should say assumptions associated associated with them, and so you trust hundreds of millions of lines of code, you have to trust the hardware, and uh, that's one way of going, and that's really the, the tried and trusted way, no pun intended. But uh, there's alternative views of the world, and uh, here's a slide that's 16 years old uh, from uh, the International Conference on Supercomputing, uh, Ed Su's talk from 2003, uh, that talks about uh, 
a, a, a different uh, philosophy of uh, not trusting the operating system and essentially assuming a privileged adversary that is able to do resource allocation and therefore is more potent than a regular process. And so there's a few ideas in the slide that are important to uh, this talk. And uh, as you can see here, um, uh, the slide does look old, that ship looks like it's from the 50s, and you see a CRT monitor and, uh, uh, and a CD-ROM uh, telling you how, how old the slide is. But uh, one of the things that's interesting here uh, that comes from the fact that the operating system is untrusted is the fact that you have to have a secret key inside of the processor. Um, you, in order to know that the operating system isn't corrupting the process, the software that's running, you have to have some sort of local or remote attestation mechanism that's tied to the hardware. And that involves cryptographic measurement of the software that's running inside of these containers or enclaves, and you need a secret key for that. Right? So that's one of the reasons why. Uh, there was no uh, real uh, a threat associated with side channels, you know, back 15 years ago, uh, in the sense of the threat that exists today. I mean, they, people knew about these things, but certainly this uh, talk ignored that. Uh, but there was this uh, security parameter that needed to be specified, and so the leakage associated with uh, uh, memory, the RSA example that I gave you, the fact that if you made a memory access when your secret bit was zero and you did not when you made your secret bit was one, uh, was something that required protection on the memory channel, and you can see that here. And then the last thing is, if the operating system is untrusted, you know, is it just the hardware that you trust? Or for convenience, and also for um, adaptability, for uh, uh, getting more functionality into your processor, uh, uh, or different versions of your processor, uh, generally you want to do some sort of hardware, software, trusted computing base, but you want to minimize this trusted software base to be the point where it's doing fairly minimal functionality and so you can verify it because it's a few thousand lines of code as opposed to being uh, tens of millions of lines of code. Or at least argue about it uh, in terms of uh, uh, fairly simple arguments as I mentioned before. And so this trusted software is being called different things. Effectively in Intel SGX it's uh, microcode, uh, it's called a security monitor and other platforms that I'll describe to you. And uh, think of it as being uh, orders of magnitude smaller uh, in terms of lines of code than uh, what we have uh, in uh, regular operating systems. So some context there. And uh, let me tell you now what enclaves are. Right? So an enclave is a process. So as with anything, you're going to have uh, processes being um, uh, created. Uh, they're going to run and they're going to be destroyed. And it's exactly the same thing with enclaves. Uh, the, the operating system is allowed to do this, uh, but uh, the trusted software is going to have to monitor that and make sure that, for example, the protection regions associated with the enclave, the memory regions that are mapped out by the operating system are in fact disjoint, and so you have the secure trusted computing base checking on these invariants. And uh, you have to have a measurement, as I described to you before, uh, the code that is created by this enclave, or should, should I say, uh, that exists inside of the enclave and the data that's inside of the enclave uh, has to be essentially something that uh, corresponds to this container and the cryptographic measurement carried out by the hardware is going to give you that. I, I won't say much more about it. Um, the thing that's perhaps more interesting outside of this creation process is what really happens when the enclave is running. Because I mean, that's exactly when all of these attacks happen. And when the enclave is running, you're going to have a situation where you have sharing of microarchitectural resources, as I said. And so uh, when you're actually running on a particular machine, and perhaps it's a multi-core concomitant execution, you're, there's time sharing on a particular core, an enclave gets uh, 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 scheduled and gets descheduled, there has to be a cleaning or a flushing of this microarchitectural state that's over and beyond what processes require. And that's kind of the second part of enclaves, and those are really the only two things that you have to worry about. So it's actually not that complicated. You have to uh, think about uh, essentially the life cycle of a process, translate that to uh, the context of modern processors and uh, shared microarchitectural states. Um, and so uh, at the high level, um, if you think about a, a property that you want that's simply stated in English, that you'd like to have, which is strong isolation, beyond process isolation, 
uh, the idea would be that you assume a privileged attacker and you're essentially saying you're comparing two different things. You're saying um, if you had two different machines, the level of isolation that you get from running um, on plates or processes on two different machines um, is what you want even when you had the attacker running on the same machine as you. Right? So that's what you want. Right? And so this needs to translate into something a little bit more precise if you want to go to proofs. But it's something that uh, is easy to describe in sort of a, a 20 second uh, elevator speed. Um, there's no protection against an enclave leaking its own secrets because it writes its secret keys on standard out or it uh, times its memory access patterns because it itself is, wants to leak its secrets. So there's no protection against that. Right? But this is about uh, a, a particular threat point. And there's really three ways we could go here, right? You know, there's um, isolation because of space. You know, we're all sitting in different uh, seats. You know, that's space isolation. Uh, there's isolation in time. Uh, only one person is sitting in a particular seat at a given time. Uh, and uh, the person gets up, and another person takes the seat. And the question is, what do they leave behind? Uh, but that's temporal isolation. And then there's cryptography. You can certainly obfuscate things using encryption to get isolation. So we really only have three hammers here, and we have to use them in uh, as particular ways in order to get uh, secure on groups. And depending on uh, what you want, a particular hammer may be more interesting or more useful or more performant than uh, another hammer. So I want to give you a sense of the couple of processors that we built in my group uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, Victor Postan and Leah Levitev, the, uh, the Sancta processor a couple of years ago. Uh, this came about uh, because of uh, 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 Intel SGX and the motivation that Intel SGX gave our community and the fact that microarchitectural side channels were an issue for Intel SGX. And so I'm just going to uh, give you some sense for how you could build enclaves in uh, lightweight processors first, and then I'll talk about uh, auto water processors. Uh, and so, um, I talked about trusted computing bases, the software stack in a RISC-V, uh, which is what Sanctum is based on, looks like this picture. Uh, there's a machine mode that corresponds to privileged execution, but your trusted computing base uh, essentially includes what you see at the, at the top there and what you see at the bottom. And so the enclave itself, the only thing that you need to trust is the enclave software and the, the runtime. And uh, I mentioned uh, that you have to measure the fact that the enclave is created properly. I mentioned the trusted software corresponding to the security monitor. I'll say that the security monitor is going to allow the operating system, which is untrusted, to perform resource allocation. But it has a set of invariants that it checks, namely disjointness of memory regions and a bunch of other things that ensure that the operating system is doing the right thing and would essentially not allow the creation of the enclave because it's running in machine mode if in fact these invariants were violated. Right? And so your security argument is based on the correctness of the invariants. Uh, and so the initial processor that we built uh, assumed uh, no multi-threading and more, no speculation. It's, a, it's certainly an academic processor. You could call it a, a toy processor, especially in contrast with the processors that we actually use in, in practice, be it on cell phones or on uh, laptops. <coughs> Um, and so some of the attacks that uh, I described to you are not applicable in this context simply because the processor is, is uh, similar. Um, and so uh, there's two things that we could do here. Uh, so I'm not going to talk a lot about cryptography in this uh, talk, uh, but uh, you have, as I mentioned, uh, uh, time isolation. And so uh, when you have a context switch, you have to clean microarchitectural state, not just architectural state. And so modern processors don't really you know, clean out the branch predictor uh, when you uh, switch from one process to another. It's in fact something that um, is uh, considered uh, good for performance because you can learn from uh, your uh, prior process that was executed, especially if you were sharing code. But that doesn't cut it when you talk about enclave, so you want enclave security because that could be an attack surface. And certainly private caches need to be clean. And then the other side of it is that uh, you don't necessarily want to clean the entire shared LLC because you know that's going to take too long. Um, obviously, you don't need to do that if you had spatial isolation, and that would be the other way to go. Right. So those are really the two main things. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm not going to talk much about cryptography in this talk. 
Um, you want to be a little bit careful here when you design things when you have an untrusted operating system. Um, in SGX, uh, our commercial deploy uh, deployment in 2015, uh, you have an untrusted operating system, trusted microcode, and the operating system manages the page tables. And uh, it turns out the operating system with a hypervisor could actually write page tables. And so this was what I would call a design flaw in SGX, uh, simply because um, these page tables give you isolation. And if the page tables can be corrupted, you can break isolation. And in fact, uh, uh, right about the time SGX came out, and this work was done uh, based on a simulator, a faithful simulator of SGX by Microsoft, uh, you had a situation where um, SGX was providing secure enclaves, and uh, you uh, wanted to keep uh, the uh, Rubik's Cube here, the image uh, secret inside of this enclave, and uh, one was concerned with uh, checking whether there were other images in this particular application that were similar to this Rubik's Cube, uh, and you didn't want to give that away. You didn't want to give away what you were searching for in terms of the comparison to this public image database, and that was this application. And uh, the matches would be sent back encrypted, so uh, no one would know what the matches were, and so uh, if this uh, Rubik's Cube was run inside of an enclave, then uh, obviously, uh, given that the matches were encrypted, um, you would hope that uh, the fact that you were checking uh, for a Rubik's Cube would be kept secret. But because uh, of this flaw that I mentioned, uh, the fact that uh, you could tamper with the page table entries and essentially create page faults over and over every time the enclave process that was running this Rubik's Cube comparison inside of the enclave was touching memory, uh, it, uh, you could cause a page fault because the malicious hypervisor would um, essentially erase entries from the page table or invalidate them. Uh, you had a situation where you could see page access patterns and uh, I should say access patterns and page granularity and uh, they were able to essentially discover the silhouette, black and white silhouette of this Rubik's Cube, which uh, I would consider a break uh, in, in this uh, enclave. But the enclave is now a leaky enclave. And so this was something that obviously needed to get fixed uh, if you wanted to have uh, enclave isolation on uh, Sanctum and other processes that were being built at the time. And so uh, one of the design decisions that had to be made, and this is just one example, is that you had to have uh, two sets of page tables. There's different ways of doing this. Page tables that were managed by the OS that corresponds to non-sensitive data uh, and uh, public data, and you had to have enclave page tables corresponding to essentially the data in this, uh, for this Rubik's Cube, for example, that had to reside inside of enclave memory. So like SGX, Sanctum has this uh, memory region called EV range that is essentially something that uh, the operating system can't see uh, at the uh, host application space, uh, part of it is public, but this EV range is a disjoint memory address space from everything else that uh, only the enclave can read and write. And the page tables have to reside inside of it. This required a change in the hardware because you have two sets of page tables and uh, you have to multiplex between them. Right? So there's uh, changes in the threat model, that necessitate changes in uh, system software, that necessitate changes in the hardware. And that's kind of how it goes here. And uh, I'm not going to give you many examples, but this is certainly, uh, hopefully, a good one. Um, I talked about cache timing attacks. We obviously have to protect against them. Uh, a couple of different ways of partitioning caches. There's the set partitioning and there's wave partitioning. In this particular case, uh, go ahead and let's do set partitioning. Uh, so you have um, parts of the cache that are uh, only uh, given to the operating system or only given to the enclave, green and blue, and uh, you don't have a situation where misses in one enclave uh, uh, cache set are going to affect misses in another, and you get your isolation that way. And you have to be careful here with respect to replacement logic and so on, uh, but uh, if you take that care, you can get uh, micro-architectural isolation at the shared cache level. And so, again, uh, this is a classic page covering mechanism that you could use uh, to, uh, to do something a little bit different from what page covering was perhaps invented for you know, many uh, decades ago. And page covering exploits the fact that there's a DRAM region index that's common between the cache set index and the physical page number. 
and you can essentially get a situation where um, memory looks like this. Um, what you see uh, in terms of the uh, rainbow colors in the, in the middle there are memory regions that are now DRAM regions, and you have many different colors of enclaves running, and as you can see, these memory regions are disjoint in that you know, colors aren't uh, running over each other, but uh, uh, they're uh, clearly um, spread apart uh, in the sense that you have blue in a bunch of different places, so you don't have contiguous memory regions. And uh, if you do sort of the classic page coloring, then you get your LLC sets to be, um, as you see on the right hand side of this picture, where you have a bunch of different enclaves, you know, blue, red, green, whatever, that are sharing different LLC sets. But uh, the, the hardware that uh, uh, corresponds to the, the standard hardware is going to give you non-contiguous memory regions, even though they're disjoint. And so a little bit of bit whittling and a little bit of hardware modification is going to essentially get you a, a little shifter is going to get you continuous memory regions in the DRAM as well. And uh, that is going to help you with your performance, right? So again, in the, here is an example of, of uh, you needed an architectural change in order to, uh, to get security that caused a problem with performance, uh, for example, in DMA. Now, you don't get back the entirety of the performance because your LLC is partitioned. Uh, maybe your performance got better in rare cases, uh, but you are perhaps using smaller parts of the LLC. So I don't mean to say that performance is exactly the same, but uh, this is now, again, uh, a process where you are trading off one metric for another, and these things happen over and over when you're doing secure processor design. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, and uh, uh, these were the hardware changes that we had to make on the RISC-V rocket core. Uh, and you can see uh, a, a few colors here, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, so the blue that uh, are small colors that you see kind of in the middle, I hope you can make them out, are changes to the, uh, to the page table walker that I described to you, and a little bit of multiplexing logic that you needed. Uh, and the page coloring was a software modification. Uh, and uh, then there's another blue in there that corresponds to this shifting of logic. It's really a rewiring, so there's no real logic there. And, and then finally, there was a bu bunch of microarchitectural state that needed to get flushed, as I mentioned. And so that's the, the, the yellow uh, light mustard color that you see over here. So really only a couple percent changes in area, uh, minimally invasive changes. And so this goes back to uh, what our goal was. Right? So, um, so we built this processor. Uh, it, it's, it's been published. We have an ongoing formal verification effort. And then Spectre and Meltdown came out. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Spectre and Meltdown were not applicable directly to Sanctum simply because it's uh, really an academic processor. It's a lightweight processor. Uh, you can certainly call it a toy processor and I wouldn't be offended. Um, and so uh, as uh, Spectre and Meltdown came out, I, the first thing that came to us was, uh, well, you know, we have the design philosophy that I've expounded to you in the last uh, 40 minutes or so. You know, could we take this uh, philosophy and then could we apply it to a, a more sophisticated processor? Certainly not a commercial processor, uh, but something that's way more sophisticated. And uh, as luck would have it, um, I do sit on a floor with, uh, with uh, legendary computer architects like Jack Dennis and uh, Arvind. And uh, Professor Arvind uh, is, uh, uh, and his group had uh, built uh, an auto water processor that's way more sophisticated than Sanctum published it in micro just this past year, and uh, the students you see here were involved in this process, and so uh, we uh, are in the process of uh, building auto processor that we call MI6, uh, you probably know where the name came from, uh, that corresponds to taking the scientific philosophy and uh, building it into an auto water processor. And so uh, this is what the processor looks like, so this is now graduate computer architecture at the minimum, as opposed to undergraduate computer architecture. <coughs> And uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details of all of these uh, uh, modules here, but it's essentially a, a, a lecture in a graduate class uh, and it turns into a module here and gives you performance. Um, the most important thing that I wanted to tell you was that this processor is in fact you know, significantly more sophisticated. If in fact you turned off speculation, it would be three times slower on average uh, just this processor. And so you have a lot of heavyweight architectural mechanisms that are being applied here. And uh, uh, some of these benchmarks slowed on by a factor of five if you turn off speculation. 
So that goes back to trading off performance and security. This is an untenable trade off. Uh, I mean, this is the high performance computer security conference, and no one's going to turn off um, their processor speculation mechanisms and take a factor of five hit uh, in order to get security. Right. So we have to fix this in a different way. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that we did, and we were able to do this because this processor boots Linux and runs on Amazon F1 FPGAs, uh, is we modified the processor uh, and uh, uh, the essentially added microarchitectural flushing to every shared microarchitectural state that was in this processor. And then you run uh, uh, programs on this where every time you have a system call, you're going to have to flush the state because uh, you can't leave state for the operating system to look at. And if you run these benchmarks on it, you get essentially a 5% overhead associated with these microarchitectural flushing. And so this type of uh, architectural exploration and simulation can be carried out now you know, thanks to these wonderful FPGAs that are out there and thanks to the great work that uh, Arvin students did. And so this happened in the process of weeks, you know, the modification and this, these experiments. Um, now the last little cache needs to be spatially partitioned like I described to you and uh, it turns out that it's not the, uh, the reduction of uh, cache uh, that is uh, uh, that actually results in uh, the change of performance, the reduction in performance, is the fact that you're actually using the index bits of the cache in a slightly different way because of this rotation that I mentioned to you. And I actually did not know this two years ago, uh, but after we ran these experiments, it's like, whoops, uh, we have a situation where we did this rotation in order to get DMA uh, improvement in performance, the contiguous memory locations that I told you, but it turns out that uh, the uh, index bits now change the way that, uh, that uh, cache entries are stored, and this in fact causes a larger performance degradation, so we have to go back to the drawing board and try and cut this down by changing the way that we want to do some cache positioning. Right? So this is uh, an insight that came out of uh, our analysis. The most interesting thing that came out of this uh, work was not the specter and the meltdown and turning off speculation that I'll get to in just a second, but looking at this processor, at least from my standpoint, and looking at the memory hierarchy of this processor, it's way more sophisticated than the rocket core and the memory hierarchy that we assumed in Scientific. And so you have things that, these are, uh, this is the picture that's associated with between the L1 and the L2 in the, um, the original processor that uh, Arvin built. And you have um, uh, essentially multiple cores. You have these MIS status handling registers called MSHRs. And these MSHRs are shared between the cores. You have an arbiter that's shared between the cores. And I'm stressing shared for a reason. Uh, you have a, a DQ unit that's shared between the cores. And then finally, you have this demultiplexer that is going out and returning these requests. And as you can imagine, there's a whole number of side channels associated with each of these things. And you have leakage, tiny leakage, associated with each of these constructs. Okay, the, uh, the MSHRs, the, uh, the fact that you have uh, only a single uh, DQ, Q, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it turns out, the biggest problem here is back pressure. So it turns out that when you have back pressure from the DRAM, it's going to affect time leakage in the L2. When you have back pressure on the MSHRs, it's going to affect leakage in the L1, and so on and so forth. So a careful redesign of this structure uh, was done by uh, Arvind's and my students. You had to make the arbitration mechanism fair. You had to split the queues, as you saw here, uh, associated with uh, MSHRs. You had to split them. You had to partition them. And a whole bunch of other things that uh, I obviously don't have time for. But now you can get tiny independence where you don't have uh, a dependence on the timing of one DRAM request inside of an enclave through the cache hierarchy and return it from another one. And this again has a performance overhead associated with it. That is currently the number that you see here. Uh, but obviously there's work to be done uh, in moving forward and thinking about how to do this uh, differently. Right. So um, uh, the last thing I'll say is that um, uh, the nice thing about enclaves is that you can handle these attacks corresponding to spectrum and meltdown with uh, some minimal hardware changes that's associated with um, essentially ensuring that you're not speculating when you have a uh, transfer from what inside of the enclave to outside of the enclave. Inside of an enclave, you can do anything you want. Um, and that's really the 
process or the uh, <coughs> isolation guarantee that enclaves give you because of the setup and the destruction of the enclaves. But if you're copying things and you're moving data from one protection domain to another, uh, the easiest way of making a security argument is to stop speculating. Right? And this only happens uh, some small fraction of the time, so you don't get your factor 3 or factor 5, whatever hit that's associated with stopping speculation. But there is an instruction in this processor that stops speculation, and uh, you can read what it says up here with respect to the ROB, but that essentially has a performance impact, which would be huge if you did not use this to the entirety of the enclave execution, but it's small when you're only doing it perhaps twice when the enclave is created or the enclave is destroyed, and uh, when it's created, the data is set up. And so uh, the overhead then would be negligible. Um, and the area overhead uh, is fairly minimal. It's similar to what I described before, because really the mechanisms that I described are very similar to the in-order processor. So um, I, the last thing I'll say is that, that the software associated with the enclave you know, doesn't really mean change. So let me close by talking about all the things that are really uh, 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 an issue associated with uh, everything I've told you so far. Uh, there are many challenges left uh, in order to really take these ideas and uh, ideas that I haven't talked about uh, that uh, are really, have really come out from the academic community and uh, deploy them. Uh, there's really a performance overhead, I won't say more. There's a, a fundamental problem with enclaves associated with the programming model where they trade expressivity for security. You can't make system calls directly because you're assuming an, an untrusted operating system. If you trusted the operating system, you could do other things. But, and perhaps you want to go that way. Uh, but if in fact you had an untrusted operating system, you have to have proxies and uh, there's uh, issues associated with uh, exactly how you would do this. Um, so the question is what syscall functionality should an enclave runtime provide? Building an enclave runtime that satisfies these, uh, uh, these needs of performance and security is, I think, an open problem. Um, huge problem associated with adaptivity. Adaptivity leaks, unfortunately. Adaptive architectures are in vogue. People have been doing adaptive architectures for a long time. There's so many leakage uh, channels, completion time, resource usage I talked about. Can cryptography help? I talked about cryptographic measurement, uh, but uh, certainly if you were trying to do demand paging, uh, you could use heavyweight techniques. In this context, they're uh, uh, fairly performant, where you're just doing things at the disk page level, where you use oblivious RAM and get provable security. Maybe you back off and uh, uh, use heuristic security mechanisms to do randomization and get adaptivity that way. Right? I, as I said, I personally don't uh, do that uh, in my work, but uh, certainly I don't. Uh, it may be a fine way of going. Right? Um, in general, dynamic memory allocation, anything that's dynamic is a huge problem. It's uh, adaptivity causes dynamism, dynamism causes leakage. How do you do that in a secure way? Right? So, uh, interaction with the outside world. I really only talked about dash computation. I talked about enclaves being created and being destroyed and copying happening twice. That's not what happens when you have interactive computation. Lots of things happen. The timing of interactions, you know, maybe it's dependent on the user. If there's a public deterministic schedule, there's no problem. But can you ensure a public deterministic schedule? What happens when things change because of the software, things change because of the operating system, which is interposed on these interactions? Right? So that's a big problem. Uh, and uh, there's uh, really some theoretical limitations associated with the way that we bound linkage. Uh, if people have been looking into things like differential privacy to do this, uh, this is a different construct for privacy. It's not cryptographic, uh, but that's something to keep in mind. Right? So perhaps cryptography has a role to play in both of these things, interaction as well as adaptivity, not just isolation methods. And then um, we'd like to make simple security arguments. We'd certainly like to do things formally. If you have a few thousand lines of code and perhaps small changes to the hardware, um, then perhaps you can put those two things together and go through uh, a formal description of the properties of enclaves. Uh, uh, we've done some of this, uh, but there's lots of other work uh, that's uh, probably more relevant associated with integrity, confidentiality, and, and measurement. Um, you have to model the adversary in a more precise way, model the threat model, and uh, ultimately you have to specify non-interference properties, disjointness, 
uh, that uh, execution should satisfy. Um, if you're able to go model this, perhaps you can use a model checker or a theorem prover to go actually take the state space, and this is really a high bar to achieve, take the implementation or something that's an approximation of the implementation and check invariance and say that the implementation satisfies these properties. Right? It's a long way to go. Um, and so, you know, really the desiderata for a single chip secure processor are what you see up here. Um, I'll let you read them, the things that I've already talked about. And uh, uh, depending on you know, which side of the bed I wake up in the morning, whether I'm optimistic or uh, pessimistic, you know, I say that it's uh, either close to reality or closer to reality. Um, and so uh, let me thank you for your attention and thank all the people who uh, made this talk possible. from Georgia Tech. Thank you for the great work and great talk. My question is about the scalability of enclaves. So enclaves give great performance and security when the resource requirement is limited, but when the requirement of the user goes beyond what the enclave can provide, then you start seeing crazy uh, overhead. So uh, how do you think we can uh, solve this problem? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so it's a combination of the challenges that are provided. Maybe I should have had an extra slide in there. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, this dynamic nature of uh, the execution, you know, causes a problem, as I said, and you need the on-play to adapt. Now, uh, when that adaptation is, uh, like I said, demand paging, which of course you don't want to do. I mean, that's not a very performant thing to do. Uh, there's perhaps some ideas that uh, I think are uh, 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 already uh, exist in uh, the literature that could help. Uh, but the dynamic memory allocation is, uh, is certainly a concern. Um, I, there's uh, ways you can do this. There's uh, things that uh, would allow you to increase the number of cache sets. Uh, I think it's going to be a matter of bounding the leakage. It's going to be a matter of making the runtime more sophisticated. Not only do you have to clean the process when you enter the process, but when you're changing things, you sort of can stall everything. <laughs> And uh, I, I essentially say there's a period of time, perhaps you're not speculating, and then you're increasing the, the amount of memory that is allocated to you. And you can be careful about this. It, it gets much more painful. Um, there is a way. Uh, uh, there's a path, I should say. Maybe there's not a concrete path, but uh, it, you know, it's something to work on. Right. Absolutely. So, Tanya, I'm looking for more. Um, I guess I, I had a question about how this scales out to distributed applications, um, particularly, I, I think most of the problems that we've had with security were not on node for things like Spectre and Meltdown, um, but were sort of off node for like RDMA and identifying the user over a connection like that. So, and also at the application level. So how do you identify the user on the edge of this system um, when, when you're in a distributed environment? So, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very pertinent question. So I do think uh, that uh, from a standpoint of mechanisms and from the standpoint of actually uh, the conceptual threats that uh, we have a distributed system here uh, on chip. Uh, the fact that you have multiple cores, you know, whether they were on the same chip or on different chips, if you assume a, a privileged adversary who's capable of monitoring uh, the network traffic, and which is, I guess, another plug <coughs> for assuming an untrusted operating system, you're actually in the realm of uh, distributed processing where you have a network adversary who's monitoring network communication. And so, uh, so really, a, 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 a lot of these ideas translate to that domain. And in fact, if you look at, uh, at some work that happened, uh, it came from Microsoft again, that perhaps the same group that, uh, uh, that did the uh, page fault work, uh, they looked at distributed systems and looked at uh, the transfer of information that we have uh, when you had messages uh, going back and forth and looking at the size of the messages and they were able to get information about that linkage. And uh, you know, whether that was on a network uh, or whether it was on an on-chip network, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's a question of what the threat model is and whether, uh, whether the adversary can see the length of the messages and they can see you know, what bandwidth is being used and so on and so forth. So I do think conceptually things translate. Now, of course, you know, when you take an idea and you try to uh, implement the idea or uh, evaluate the idea in a, even a slightly different context, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. 
But uh, I, I, as I said, I'll leave it at I do think uh, the mechanisms and concepts are applicable to a large extent. So. Joseph Torellis from Illinois. So we come from a time where we thought that the operating system was our friend. And we had problems with lots of system calls and so on. Now in this environment, the OS is our enemy in, in an enclave environment. We have to flush the state on every system call. This calls for a completely redesign of how we think about EOS. Any thoughts? Um, so, yeah, well, I'm not a software guy, but uh, <laughs> I guess uh, I, I, I'll say what I think. Um, so, uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think uh, this, uh, this uh, partition is artificial. Uh, this security monitor uh, is, uh, it, you know, where did it come from? You know, why do we need it? Uh, well, it's because of what you just described, Joseph. Uh, but uh, I, the, the thing that uh, I think uh, other uh, operating system people have looked at, uh, which is related to this, this work, is this uh, decoupling between resource allocation and uh, invariant checking. And that's some of these microkernel ideas really, I mean, it, I wouldn't say that it's uh, novel to the, to the security monitor. It, it really came from that, that field. So the closest thing uh, that, uh, that, I, that I have for you in terms of an answer to your question is, I, it, yes, you know, it, it's absolutely right, we need to rethink this, uh, but uh, I mean, some of these ideas, let's not ignore these ideas that uh, came in the past, you know, corresponding to microkernels, I mean, there's also things like exokernels that may be less applicable, but uh, I, I do think, I, I'm with you in that this is a hardware software co-design problem, right? I'm totally with you on that. Moin Koreshi, Georgia Tech, very nice talk training. So if, if you look at reliability and security, there are parallels, right? Everybody wants them, nobody wants to pay for them. As a community, we've done a pretty decent job of understanding reliability, coming up with solutions for reliability. For security, why is it so hard that uh, for the community to come up with solutions? Because inevitably, something happens and you find a, a weakness, the attacker exploits it, and then we are again back to the board. Uh, is there a structured way to reason about this, or is this going to be uh, a cat and mouse game? Well, um, well, I would hope uh, for the form. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, uh, I mean, you've got to have a little bit of the latter, uh, because I think you make mistakes even in the structured way of thinking about it. But uh, absolutely, I mean, you know, cat and mouse, patch and gray, you know, I think that's the, uh, the less uh, charitable version of that. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that I really would personally like to get away from. Uh, and, and you know, one of the things that I think is amazing in the security world uh, is that uh, attackers are uh, well, so smart and they have such a broad, holistic view of the computing system, right? And I think one of the things that's bitten us uh, in the past, I mean, and I mean uh, broadly speaking, you know, the architectural community, both industry and academic, is that, you know, we, in order to manage complexity, we've uh, partition things, we've partitioned responsibilities, right? We've said, here's this API, you know, go off and run with it, I don't care about what you do as long as you maintain that, and get performance any which way underneath that API, and uh, you know, I'm gonna go off and do my thing and you do your thing, right? The attackers have looked at what has happened, what has uh, uh, transpired you know, through the process of independent design, and you know, perhaps compromise, and they've exploited that, right? And so that, I would say, is not something that reliability, you know, people worry about because it's just an average case thing and it's not a worst case thing. So at some level, I think what you have to do is you have to go back and it's the structured way, but it's a different structured way, right? It's uh, maybe there's more discipline associated with it, right? Uh, maybe the interfaces just need to be stronger. I mean, the easy way out is to say, ah, oh, well, you know, we're gonna figure this out if we just make our APIs uh, much stricter and, and, and uh, you know, more detailed also because you want them to be more detailed because you don't want to give away all of these optimizations that the more detailed API gives you, right? So, so that's my, uh, I guess maybe my weak answer. Thank you. Next session starts in about 10 minutes. I think this is true for all three conferences.